suppose one of you had some unexpected company who showed up late at night. Being a gracious host, you ask if he is hungry. And indeed, he admits he is famished. He hasn't eaten all day and the hour is late. And so you head to the kitchen. You're heading for the refrigerator. But even as you're going into the kitchen, your heart is sinking because you know that you haven't been to the store in days. You've been out of town. You've been eating out, eating on the run. You have nothing to feed him. Your cupboards are essentially bare. The closest store is, what, miles away that's open this late at night. What are you going to do? Suddenly, in the fog of your late-night dilemma, you get a bright idea. You think about your bread-baking friend. She has one of those throw-in-the-pot, all the ingredients for bread, ba- bread makers, and she, she always has fresh bread for her family, and she's often, often sharing that bread with you. So you look out through the window across the field to your neighbor's house, your bread-baking neighbor's house, and the lights are out. I mean, after all, it's quite late. But you wonder. You know she can be kind of cranky at times, but, but you think she would understand because, I mean, she is your neighbor and you consider her a friend. So you get up the nerve, put on your shoes, your jacket, you cross a You you cross the field up to her doorstep, up to her door. You knock, and there's silence. You knock again. Pretty soon she hollers out, who's there? You identify yourself. Ah, Mrs. Smith, I have a guest who arrived from Seattle. I have nothing to feed him. And I was just thinking about you and those those delicious loaves of bread of yours. Um, do Do you think I could buy or borrow one of those loaves of bread? Silence. What's that, boy? You want a loaf of my bread? Why are you bothering me at this late hour? She scolds. The door's locked. My children are sleeping. You're going to wake up the whole neighborhood with your racket out there. I can't get up and give you anything at this time of night. For some odd reason, the protest from inside doesn't deter you. You say, I'm sorry for bothering you, but look, If you'd just please do me this favor, I'd sure appreciate it. Silence. Again. Mrs. Smith? After a bit, the porch light comes on, and there's Mrs. Smith in her robe holding a loaf of bread. And as she's handing it to you, she's kind of shaking her head and rolling her eyes a little bit, but also with a little bit of a smile. Now, I've altered the details of Jesus' story to bring home one of this these amazing parables of Jesus, and it's found in Luke 11. Actually, Jesus describes the guy knocking on his friend's door as showing up at midnight. And he doesn't just ask for one loaf of bread, he asks for three loaves of bread. Check out the story. You might want to open your Bibles this morning to Luke 11, looking especially at verses 5 to 8. Now, as Jesus begins the story, he begins by saying, Suppose one of you has a friend. Notice, the neighbor, the person being approached in Jesus' story is considered a friend. And the guy who's out of food goes to his friend at midnight and calls him friend, says, friend, lend me three loaves of bread because another friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Then the sleepy friend inside answers, and this is the part that kind of sounds like old Mrs. Smith, verse 7, don't bother me, the door is already locked, my children are with me in bed, I can't get up and give you anything. Jesus went on to say in verse 8, I think we're putting it up on the screen, I tell you, though he will not get up and give him bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's, what? boldness, insistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. What is clear in Jesus' story is someone has a friend who's hungry, a friend in in need. And, And that friend is someone who's willing to stick his neck out to borrow bread so that he would have food for someone else to eat. Not all that surprisingly, The neighbor is reluctant to help at that late hour, and he yells out through the closed door, I can't get up and give you anything. Well, it turns out he could help, 
And Jesus says in verse 8, as we've already noted, because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. This parable is told in the context of Jesus' teaching about prayer. Jesus is not saying God is like Mrs. Smith who scolds her friend in the middle of the night. He doesn't have to be woken up for us to ask his help. Rather, the grumpy, reluctant neighbor is seen in contrast to the way God really is. The point Jesus seems to be making is, if through boldness or persistence, you could get bread at midnight from a sleepy, grumpy friend, how much more will you get bread? How much more will you get help from your Heavenly Father, especially if you are bold and persistent in your requests? Jesus is saying the man who boldly asks for bread at midnight illustrates how we should be approaching God in prayer. Now, the word translated as boldness in verse 8 in my Bible is translated in the King James Version as importunity. I didn't even know what that meant. So for starters, I googled it. Importunity um, means or refers to persistence in requesting. It's based on the word importunate which means urgent or persistent in asking, refusing to be denied, even to the point of demanding and being troublesome or annoying. Don't you think that describes the effect on the sleepy neighbor behind closed doors? But I was also intrigued by a more literal translation of the word in the Greek, and that is shamelessness. Shamelessness. I love mangoes. But my favorite tropical fruit are lychees. And I have to tell you, Peggy would uh, uh, attest to this, I am always excited when we find lychees on vacation in Maui. Always excited. Lychees, they have this red skin that you peel back. And there's this sweet, juicy, white, grape-like morsel that you pop in your mouth. And there's a little smooth seed that you spit out. But it is, it is just heavenly. Um, I think we got a little spoiled when we lived in, in Hilo because lychees bro grow prolifically on the Big Island, the wet side there uh, on the Big Island of Hawaii at, at Hilo. Um, every time we are headed to Hilo, I'm always thinking about lychees. Is it lychee season? And the, the last time we were in Hilo, it was lychee season. And the first thing I did when I saw our friend Rosie, I said, Rosie, where can we get some lychees? And sure enough, she knew where we could get some lychees, and she had, knew some friends, some church members out in the boondocks who we were able to go out to an orchard and get ourselves some lychees. When we were living there, we had a friend of ours tell us about how her husband during lychee season would search all over the place, always was on the lookout for a great huge lychee tree laden with fruit, and wasn't hesitant to go up and ask people if he could help himself to some of their lychees. And when she told us this, she said with a sheepish smile, he has no shame. It reminds me how as a poor college student, I would go and ask people for flowers out of their yards so I could give flowers to my sweetie, Peggy. I, I would get these great, huge, fragrant bouquets of lilacs out of people's yards just for the asking. Big, colorful bouquets of roses just for the asking. Well, I, I was telling a friend about this in Hawaii uh, about doing this, and she smiled and she said, oh, no shame. It's an expression we sometimes hear in the islands. The disciples... In, observe Jesus' incredible relationship with his heavenly Father, and there was no shame. They heard Jesus' deeply moving prayers. They saw the effect prayer had on his whole countenance and miraculous ministry, and they wanted to pray like Jesus prayed. And so they appealed to him, Lord, Lord, teach us to pray. After teaching them the Lord's Prayer, Jesus told this little story about a man with no shame who through boldness and persistence got results for his request for bread. Jesus seems to be saying, if you want to be effective in praying, if you want to see results and answers to your prayer, then you be, need to be like that man with no shame. Be bold. Be persistent in your requests. Now, as I've thought of Jesus' teaching on this, 
I've reflected, and I've kind of pushed back a little bit with the Lord. And I said, yeah, but Lord, so often we have a high, hard time just praying at, at all, let alone being so bold. I mean, that's certainly true for me in my experience. So, so often we pray half-hearted prayers. We whisper our prayers as if we're not sure he hears and answers. We pray as if he's a stranger behind closed doors who says, don't bother me, I can't get up and help you right now. The fact is, many of us come to God with shame. And it is our shame, not God, his character or his responses that hinder earnest, effective praying. So what fosters, what perpetuates shame in our relationships with God? For one thing, we don't really know God as a loving father. Too often we relate to him as a distant dad or a, uh, an indifferent stranger. We don't know enough of his unconditional love and care. We, we may know something of his, his uh, power, something of his holiness, but we do not know his love is like that of a daddy, a papa who loves to help, who loves to, to, to give good gifts to his children. Tim Kimmel tells how for the first 40 years of his life, he just always seemed to lack confidence as a man. He had a hard time bearing responsibilities as a husband and a father. There was a deep void in his life, a gnawing emptiness that had badgered him since he was three years old. Like all boys, he needed the love of a father, the mentoring of a man who believed in him. He needed to hear his dad cheering his victories and putting his caring arms around him in his defeats. But the hope of those needs being fulfilled was shattered when his dad was killed on his first day on a World War II battlefield. His mother eventually remarried, and his stepdad loved Tim. He did a noble job of trying to complete the process Tim's biological father had started. But there just always seemed to be something missing, a, a, a sense of approval, the the confidence that Tim was special, the, the assurance that the man who begot him loved him with all of his heart. For some mystifying reason, the loss of his father, I loved you, seemed to hold him back in life until one day, Tim found himself in his mom's attic. She and his stepdad were moving, and Tim had come to help them and say goodbye to his childhood home. His mom was packing some things away when she came ac across the framed picture of her first husband, Tim's dad. It was the 8 by 10 portrait that he had made of himself and framed it and sent to her just days before he was shipped off to the battlefield to Europe. She only had had it for a few days before he was killed. Now, Tim had seen that picture many times. It helped him to imagine what his dad was like probably more than anything else. After looking at that black and white picture in silence, his mom handed the picture to Tim and said softly, Here, son, I want you to have, have this. But as he reached out for the picture, he lost grip of it, and it fell crashing to the floor, breaking glass, breaking the cheap frame that had encased it for 37 years. That's when he saw the envelope the unopened envelope in the pile of glass, a letter written by Tim's father, a letter of love for Tim dated just days before he gave his life for his country. That letter contained words that Tim had longed to hear from his dad for his whole life. In dad's, his dad's handwriting, Tim read how much his father loved him, how proud he was for Tim to be his dad, how comp for Tim for his son, how confident he was that God would empower Tim to grow up to be a great man. Tim says finding that letter was like receiving a letter from heaven. A whole new confidence blossomed in the heart of 40-year-old Tim. The doubts were gone. Indeed, he had been deeply loved by his earthly father. And he also knew his heavenly father loved him so much to preserve such a special message for him at a time in his life when he needed it most. 
Why do so many of us have such little confidence when we pray? So why do we struggle with doubt and shame? We don't really know God as a loving father. And yet Jesus said, when you pray, call God Father. Pray, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. God is holy. He is awesome. He is sovereign and he is Lord. And our Heavenly Father is ministering on our behalf in heaven. He's establishing a whole new kingdom with our Savior Jesus. Our Heavenly Father is making sure there's a place being prepared for us in home, in his home, in his kingdom. The kingdom God is establishing is a kingdom in which fathers and mothers are not torn apart from their children. A kingdom in which young and old alike will never have doubts about their value and significance. A kingdom in which God's love and power reigns over our hearts forever. Jesus ended his teaching on prayer in Luke 11 by again emphasizing God is like a loving father. Notice verse 11, he asked, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? One of the most precious gifts that we've received from God through the Holy Spirit is scripture. It's the Bible. And yet, unfortunately, the Bible is often like a love letter that's hidden away for years from children who would be so blessed if they could just read it. The Bible is for people whose lives would be completely changed if they would discover that message of love, the message of hope and, and, and truth and life that's written there. I think of the story of Tim and how an unmet need in his life, the need of a father's love and affirmation, somehow hindered his confidence. What blocks boldness in prayer? What causes shame? Not knowing God as a loving father, yes. But also unmet needs. Unmet needs often bring a sense of shame and can hinder our confidence and boldness with God. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said we're to pray, give us each day our daily bread. Jesus is assuring us that God cares about our personal needs. He cares about our finances. He understands the heartache that comes with the loss of a job or the loss of a home. He cares about a person who is hungry or cold. He knows a person without shelter is going to have a hard time getting past his pain, his hurt, and his shame. Having faith and confidence in God will be very difficult unless his basic needs are met. Jesus knows how people can just be totally consumed by worry over basic life needs. But in his famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus assures us that God cares about these needs. In Matthew 6, 25, Jesus says, Do not worry. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away, store away in barns. And yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And then Jesus goes on to say, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given you as well. Jesus invites us to have a relationship of trust in God in which we expect him to provide for our basic needs. Scripture promises us today in Philippians 4.19. Shall we read it together? My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Isn't that amazing? God cares. He cares about our needs. He will supply our needs according to his riches in glory. Now, God doesn't promise to supply all of our wants, but he will supply our basic needs. 
Just as it is reasonable for a child to expect a good daddy to provide food and clothes and shelter, so we can expect those needs to be provided by our Heavenly Father. He provides the health, the education, the skills, the energy, the jobs, and other resources we need to provide for us and our loved ones. Consider Adam and Eve in the garden after they sinned and how they fled from the presence of the Lord and hid themselves. Suddenly, not having clothes was a problem, and they felt naked. They felt ashamed. But God hadn't changed. They might have changed from sin. God hadn't changed. His love for them hadn't changed even after they ate the forbidden fruit. God was still a caring creator, a good father, in fact, the Bible tells us how he began to meet their needs, how he lovingly provided clothes to cover their nakedness. Now, those clothes were actually made of animal skins. God apparently took the life of precious animals, innocent animals, in order to cover their nakedness. Through that painful experience, God began to show them and us a plan to save us. God began to reveal the plan of salvation and how a provision would be made for our forgiveness and restoration to relationship and eternal life with God. Someone would come. Someone would come and die in our place. A Savior would come to cover our nakedness caused by sin. A Savior would come to take away our shame. The story of the fall reveals the root cause of all shame. We don't necessarily love and trust God as a good father, and we don't always have our needs immediately met because of sin. Fathers go to war and must leave their wives and kids. People go hungry and have inadequate clothing and shelter and feel embarrassment and shame because of sin. And not necessarily because of their sin, but the sins of others, just sin in the world that we live in. And yet Jesus taught us that when it comes to our sins, we're to pray. Admit your sins to your Father. Ask Him for forgiveness. And don't just ask Him for forgiveness. Believe He does forgive. Thank Him for forgiveness. I know how in my relationship with God, thanking God for forgiveness has helped me to hold on to promises from God. Thanking Him for forgiveness is to, to, a way to show God I believe Him and I cherish His grace. But the Lord's Prayer teaches us not just to ask for forgiveness or thank Him for forgiveness for ourselves. The prayer teaches us to search our hearts and make sure we are treating other people with grace. Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. God calls us to treat others as we have been treated by God to be forgiving ourselves. The Lord's Prayer is encouraging us to pray without shame. A summary of the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11, verses 2 to 4 says, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. With the Lord's Prayer in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew quotes Jesus as emphasizing the part or the point of forgiving others as the most important part of effective prayer. God longs for us to treat others with grace as he is treating us with grace ourselves. The promise to Mary and Joseph and to all of us was, you will call his name Jesus for he will what? Save his people from their sins. If you feel shame today, if you're holding back and making requests to God, if you're not persistent in asking and seeking and knocking as Jesus teaches us to pray, then I'm prompted to ask, is it because of sin in your life? Please know there is a remedy for sin. The remedy is found in God's heart, his love and in his gift of Jesus on the cross. The Bible assures us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the Bible promises if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we're assured we can come and pray with no shame. 
We can come with expectations like little children, asking God for blessings, asking him for help to follow him. We can ask him for answers, trusting he will act according to his love and grace. And yet often, even when we have assurance of forgiveness and salvation, we still don't pray like that man who came so boldly at midnight asking for bread. We are not bold. We're not persevering. We still act like we have shame. Why? Here's one more cause for shame, and that's simply human weakness and vulnerability. I think of the prayer phrase, lead us not, and lead us not into temptation. For as long as we live in this world, we are subject to temptation. As long as Satan can make a whole range of, how do I say this delica delicately, disgusting sins, tempting or desirable, we are subject to embarrassment and pain and shame. And yet Jesus says when you pray, ask God to protect you. Ask him for help. Ask him for deliverance. Ask him to lead you away from temptation and keep seeking and keep knocking for his blessings. Assuring us if fathers, good fathers know how to give and love to give good gifts to their children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to those who ask him? Through the working of the Holy Spirit, we can know God's love as a father. Through the Holy Spirit, we can experience more and more of our needs being met. Through the Spirit, we can experience a deeper repentance from sin and a greater assurance of forgiveness and cleansing. Through the Holy Spirit, we can overcome temptations and experience less weakness and vulnerability and more grace and more power. Jesus is calling us. He's inviting us to pray without shame. He is calling us to persevere in prayer until we are changed. He invites us to pray and pray and pray until we start seeing more answers and receiving more blessings in prayer. He's calling us to pray alone in our relationship with him, and he's calling us to pray with others as well. I join with Peggy in inviting you to make a commitment a determined effort to become a prayer partner or be or continue to be a prayer partner with someone else. I know how profoundly my life has been blessed through having a prayer partner. First of all, praying with Peggy on a daily basis throughout our married life. What a huge blessing that has been. But also having various brothers, various men in the church of the years that I've had as prayer partners. More recently, I have a friend who we've just been kind of, you know, praying together once in a while, just occasionally. And recently I asked him, I said, how about we make an effort, we make a commitment to be prayer partners and to make the goal at least to pray together once a week, you know, 15 minutes, a half hour, whatever we can do. And we are just both so excited to see what God will do as we pray more together. This month marks the end of my first year here with Peggy at East. We have been so blessed for so much love, so much care, so many prayers and support that we've experienced here in the church in the last year, and I know many others have been blessed as well. But as I think about the opportunities, the, uh, the, 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 the needs, the challenges that we have moving forward, I am personally reminded how much I need your prayers. Don't we all? Amen. Don't we all need each other's prayers? There was an author who asked the question, so do you have a pastor you don't like? A pastor who is perhaps inefficient or doesn't know or preach the truth? Do you want a new minister? The writer goes on to say, I can tell you how to get him, how to get a new pastor. Pray for the one you have till God makes him over. There was a church in Connecticut which had a pastor who was very bright but not very sound in doctrine. And there were three godly men in that church who realized their pastor wasn't preaching the truth. So what would they do? They made a covenant that they would begin praying together for their pastor. They would meet once a week, they would meet one night a week, and they, would begin, they began meeting every week and prayed together, sometimes late into the night, until one day their pastor rose to speak, and those men knew something had changed. God had transformed 
this man's ideas. He was still as, as gifted, um, bright and gifted as ever, but God had transformed his ideas. God had transformed the man. Have you ever heard how Dwight L. Moody became a worldwide evangelist? After the great fire in Chicago, Mr. Moody went to England for rest. He was very tired. Um, he had no plans to preach. But one Sunday in Pastor Lessie's Congregational Church in North London, Mr. Moody was invited to speak. As it turned out, Moody had great difficulty preaching that day. He said later that it seemed as though he was pulling a heavy train up a steep grade the whole time. And he said to himself, what a fool I was to consent to preach. Here I came to London to hear others preach, and I'm preaching. And he was just so glad to get through the morning, and afterwards he tried to release himself from speaking that evening. But Pastor Leslie would not consent. That night, Moody went to preach with a heavy heart. He said, but I had not been preaching long when it seemed as if the powers of an unseen world had fallen upon the audience. As I drew to the close of my sermon, I got the courage to draw the net. These are Moody's words. I asked all that would then and there accept Christ to rise, and about 500 people stood to their feet. I thought, surely there must be some mistakes. So I asked him to sit down, and I said, there will be an after meeting in the vestry after the meeting. If you will really accept Christ, meet the pastor and me in the vestry. Well, there was a door on each side of the pulpit, and after the meeting, there was just streams of people going through these doors. And Moody turned to Pastor Lessie and said, Pastor Lessie, who are all these people? He said, I don't know. Are they your people? He says, no. He said, are they, well, some of them are. Are they Christians? Not as far as I know. So he goes into the vestry, and Moody repeats the invitation in a stronger form. Everyone stood. He had them be seated. He repeated the invitation in an even stronger form. Everybody stood. He was sure there was a mistake. So he said, I'll tell you what. I'm going to Ireland tomorrow, but your pastor is going to be here tomorrow night. And if you really mean what you've said here tonight, then meet him here. After Moody reached Ireland, he received a telegraph from Pastor Leslie saying, Mr. Moody, there were more people out on Monday night than Sunday night. A revival has broken out, and you must come over and help me. Moody hurried back and conducted a series of meetings that added hundreds of people to the churches of North London. And with that led to other invitations and a ministry that stirred the world. But that's not the point of the story. You see, there were two sisters in that church in North London. One of them was bedridden. And her, other, her sister had heard Moody speak the first time that Sunday morning in church and came home to her bedridden sister and said, guess who the guest speaker was in church today? And her sister started naming off the you know, usual people that would be guest speakers. And finally, she blurted out and she said, Mr. Moody of Chicago. She said, what? Mr. Moody of Chicago? I've read about him in an American paper, and I've been praying that God would bring him to London and bring him to our church to speak. If I had known that he was speaking this morning, I would have eaten no breakfast. I would have been fasting and praying all morning. Now, sister, go out, lock the door. Don't let anybody come in. Don't bring me any dinner. I'm going to spend the whole afternoon and evening in prayer. And that's exactly what she did. Pray she did. God is just as ready to hear and answer your prayer as he was that bedridden saint some years ago. In book one, Selected Messages, one of the precious founders of our church wrote this. A revival of true godliness is the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs. This should be our first work. Our Heavenly Father is more willing to give his Holy Spirit to those who ask him than earthly fathers, earthly parents, to give good gifts to their children. But it is our work by confession, humiliation, repentance, and earnest prayer to fulfill the conditions upon which God has promised to grant his blessing. A revival need it be expected only in answer to prayer. And so our Father says to us today, ask, ask, and it will be given you. Ask for daily bread, 
Ask for those basic needs to be met. Ask for forgiveness. Pray about your spiritual needs. Put away your sin and shame and come. Come with perseverance. Come with boldness and keep on asking and seeking and knocking until you see lives changed, until you see revival and reformation. Are you willing to commit to making prayer a greater priority in your life? To persevere in prayer with seeking a new boldness that you haven't had before in your daily walk with God? If God is putting it in your heart to make prayer a priority, I'm wondering if you'd like to just come forward. This doesn't have to be everyone. Not everyone is able to come forward. But just come forward to the front for the closing prayer this morning. Would you be willing to do that? If you'd like to just say, yeah, I want to make prayer a greater priority in my life. I want to, I want to persevere more in prayer and, and seek to learn to be more bold in my praying. Would you like to come forward? I invite you to do that as we close. You know, I, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you this morning in your personal times with God. Be bold. Be strong. Love him. Trust him. With all of your heart, pray. And keep on praying. Seek to experience God in a whole new way. And, and experience God with someone else. Uh, I, I join with Peggy again. You know, just at least consider. Pray about seeking out a prayer partner. You may already have a prayer partner in your spouse or in a friend but I would encourage you as well to to consider that as well. And maybe before we pray, we should sing uh, a little chorus together. Come, Holy Spirit, I need you. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in your strength and your power. Come in your own gentle way. Heavenly Father, we praise you for being our Father, for being a God of love who meets us where we're at and encourages us with grace. Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray alone. Teach us to pray with others, at least one other. Teach us not to be so timid in how we whisper our prayers, but to learn to pray more boldly without shame through your grace and power. Please, Lord, pour your Holy Spirit upon us today and every day. Lord, we pray for revival and reformation. Teach us to pray and to be more bold about praying for that and and learning, discovering what that looks like, what that means. I'm, I expect we, we're, we're, we'll, all, we'll all be surprised as we see you continue to work in new ways in, in our lives and in the church. And in all this, Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God answers prayer in the morning. God answers prayer at noon. God answers prayer in the evening. So keep your heart in tune. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Go in God's grace today.